Good morning, church family. You ready to get into the word today? Amen. If you are ready to get into the word today, lean over to your neighbor on the right side of you and say to them, I'm ready, I'm ready. And some of you are talking to yourself. All right, a couple of very, very important church announcements, all right? Um, just in case you didn't know this, I am assuming 99% of you already know this, but the two rows in the back are reserved exclusively for the gut shots. <laughs> Say, why are you telling us that, Pastor? Because I came in this morning and Terry Gutshaw had a tent, had sleeping bags, and he was here early. I said, Terry, listen, we all know this is your row. You don't need to bring a sleeping bag says, I got to get it early. I got to get it early. All right. Um, before the children are dismissed, I, I leaned over at Mandy uh, Johnson. I said, do you have the hots for the guitarist lead singer today? And she said, Pastor, we've been married for a long time. <laughs> I'm over that. <laughs> Oh, we're just having fun. Well, listen, kids, you are dismissed over to Junior Church. And who's got them today? Miss Sharon does. And Miss Sharon's got uh, her sisters, her two sisters. So we want to welcome Laura and Emily. Laura's visiting from the state of Texas. If you are from Texas, it's more like the country of Texas. You own that. You are your own state right there. And her other sister, Emily, from Pennsylvania uh, area, is that right? Ohio, West Virginia, country home. Give me those roads. We're glad. And if you are visiting us for the very first time or first time in a long time, we're really glad you're here. And if you would take a moment and fill out that connection card, we would love to have a record of your visit and then be able to connect with you sometime this week. All right. So you told me you were ready, ready, ready to receive the word today. Now, if you've been following along in this sermon series, it's been Psalm 1, Psalm 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And then somewhere along the line, I'm like, wait a minute. Do I keep going consistently or can I just fast forward a little bit? And so I'm going to ask your permission today to fast forward a little bit. We're going to Psalm 9 and Psalm 10 today with your permission. So if you're ready, I'm ready. Amen? All right. So let's turn to the book of Psalm chapter number 9. And that's where we'll be today. All right. Carl, good to have you back, man. Thank you for coming. Carl is a uh, brother to Karina Eggers. And Karina, who, if you haven't met Karina yet, Karina is the uh, mom uh, to one of our other gals who attend our church as well, uh, the Van Dusens, Tiana. And Karina got saved a couple weeks ago. I met with Karina, and Karina's going to get baptized. How about that? <laughs> really excited about that. She shared her testimony, and I said, it was so perfect. I wish I could record it. And as a matter of fact, may I record it? And she was like, oh, if you have to. And I got the camera out and recorded it. I can't wait for you all to listen to her own words and her own testimony of how she came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as her Savior and her willingness to let everyone know and declare it publicly with the church family. So exciting times. Well, <clears throat> sometimes I go out uh, visiting uh, last winter, I went out and visited with John Pratt, and he just came to the church for uh, the first time since I've been a pastor. And so I went out there in the middle of winter, knocked on the front door, and nobody answered the door. And so I was ready to leave, my wife and I, and then all of a sudden a voice from the uh, voice came walking towards the front door and said, you got to go around the other side, I don't use the front door. So I went all the way to the back, but unfortunately there was no pathway to the back, only about oh, six inches of snow. And so all these little Asian footprints, you know Asian footprints are a lot different than Caucasian footprints, right? This is Caucasian footprints and then Asian footprints. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So I went all the way to the back and John met with me 
And I said, John, I'm just here to drop off some cookies. Hope you enjoy it. This is from our church family. Don't worry. We're not trying to poison you. It's chocolate chip. So he uh, took it, appreciated it, and then we went off. But it reminded me of this pastor who went and visited some folks in his church and knocked on the door and nobody answered. Knocked on the door and nobody answered and knocked on the door and rang the doorbell. Still nobody answered. So he decided to take out one of his business cards and he wrote on the back of it, Revelation 3.20. You'll have to look that up at some point. And so he left and then it was time for the offering. And somebody took out one of the connection cards and wrote on the card, Genesis 3.10. This is odd. So the pastor took that little connection card and looked up Genesis 3.10. And he remembered, he wrote Revelation 3.20, which reads, I stand at the door and knock. But the person who put the connection card in the offering wrote Genesis 3.20 that says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid, for I was naked. <laughs> oh, John, we know why you didn't answer the door the first time. <laughs> Psalm chapter, we have to laugh a little bit in church, right? Listen, we live in a world where it's already sad and depressing. And it, you go from sad and depressed to angry and frustrated. You know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one? All right. Just turn on the, the TV and you will either go from the extremity of what in the world you have lost your mind to the next moment and say, how could you? And you just want to, oh, this is just insane madness. Uh, Psalm chapter number 9 and chapter number 10 has this sort of lull. Last week we learned about lamenting. One extreme, and now today I want to take you to confident in crisis. What you, do you do when crisis enters into your life? Someone once said, don't tell me you're a Christian when things are all right. Show me that you're a Christian when things are all wrong. Amen, Lord. I, he, he heard you, and you better hear him, all right? On cue. Told you the Lord is on time every time. All right. You can take that to the bank. But here's the thing. There are going to be moments where you have great crisis in your life. Great downtime in your life. You can tell me how much of an amazing Christian you are. You can take your camera out and you can Instagram that Bible devotion moment where your coffee cup, your Bible, your journal, your markers, and everything is set in place. But can you, can you show me what being a Christian and what your faith is all about when things aren't looking so pretty? My cousin, Charlie, is in the hospital. It's been a week and a half, and he's still in a coma. Charlie's one of the most awesome Christians I know. Charlie is an assistant pastor at the church that we grew up in, and he also serves as the principal of the school at the present. His older, he's the youngest of three siblings. Uh, Nancy's the oldest, Perry. The second, I led Perry to the Lord at my house, 14 years old. I was shivering. I wanted to tell uh, my family members how to know uh, that they can be saved. And I have been praying for my sister, for my brother, for my mom. And none of those family members got saved at that time. They didn't want to hear it from me. And I tried. And, but I was fervent. And so I shared that gospel with my cousin. And she got saved. She, her husband for many years was an assistant pastor at the church, still very actively involved in the church. And then shared the gospel with my older cousin, Pir uh, Piram Nancy, and then eventually Charlie. They all got saved, went to a Bible college, and Charlie is uh, the father of 
five children. They were all in the accident. His daughter was just released. What is your faith like when you're in the hospital? What is your faith like when you've lost a loved one? What is your faith like when you lost a job? What is your faith like when a friend that's closer than any other seemingly stabs you in the back? What happens when things aren't as pretty as that Christian life that you were making it out to be? Show me that Christian faith. This is what David does for us in Psalm chapter 9 and Psalm chapter number 10. Psalm 9 is a mix of both praise and petition, celebration and setback. Isn't that pretty much a metaphor of life? There are good days and bad days. There are moments of which we can smile and laugh, while on another moment we cry and we mourn. That is the metaphor of life, Psalm 9 and Psalm 10. The theme of this entrance into Psalm 9 and 10 is this. God is more powerful than your enemies, and he is concerned for our struggles. We can and should turn to God in the midst of our struggles. Why should we despair when we believe God is in complete control over our lives and the affairs of this world? Let me ask you that question again. Why should you be despaired when you believe that God is in complete control of your life and your affairs and the affairs of this world? Because if you really believe in the sovereignty of God, in the supremacy and the lordship of Jesus Christ, you would recognize that God never got off of his throne just because of this president or just because of this world leader or just because of this crisis or just because of this war or just because of fill in the blank he never got off of the throne he is still God yesterday today and forever you don't think he is you don't feel like he is but let me tell you something friend he still is and he still loves you, and he still knows you, and he's still for you. And the Bible says in Romans 8 that he's working all of it out, all of the messiness, all of the junk, all of the things that are happening in your life. And he says he's working it out for the good of those who love him and those who are called to him. God loves you, and he knows you. The journey of our suffering David teaches us here, the journey of our suffering starts with praise. The journey of our suffering doesn't necessarily start with you on your knees and you bemoaning and you lamenting and you praying, God save the day. The journey of your suffering, David teaches us here, it starts with praise. Why and how in the world was it that David, who had a king uh, named Saul to come after him and wanting to kill and destroy him, and then eventually had a son who wanted to kill him and people within the kingdom wanted to overthrow him even? How did he go from all of that to hiding out in a cave to the point where he was able to say, God, yea, though I walk through the valley. The word yea, though I walk, is a recognition. It wasn't like, yay! It was like, yes, Lord. I know that when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So the yay does not become a celebratory yay. It becomes a confident yay. And that's the confidence that I'm wanting you to walk with me in Psalm 9 and Psalm 10. Confident in crisis. How can you and I learn this lesson from David? He's teaching us how to respond to hardship. 
He does this by beginning with words of praise. The context of psalm is battle, but the focus is the character and the activity of God. I want you to look at Psalm chapter number 9. And because we're reading so many um, chapters, 9 and 10, and lots of verses in between all of it, they're not going to be on your screen today, but instead listen to me as I declare the word of God to you. May I do this before I begin the reading? May I pray for us? Father, I pray that these words from your word would enter and penetrate not just our 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 ears, Lord, but may it penetrate our heart and may it be in our minds and may we chew on it this week. And Lord, whenever crisis enters into our life, may we have the confidence knowing that, God, you are with us. And that is enough confidence that I can have to walk in through the shadows of death because, God, I know that if you are with me, if you are for me, what can be against me? My God, my God. You are worthy of our attention. As we open up your word, show us. Let us behold wondrous things out of thy law. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name and God's people said. Verse number one says, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I want you to know the type of confidence a person says when they say, I will do something. Do you ever have someone who has has told you before, yep, I'll see you at 9 o'clock tomorrow. When they say it, you have such great confidence because you know their character, don't you? And then there are others who say, I'll see you at probably 9 o'clock. And in your mind, you also know their character and you're thinking, whew. It might be 9.10, 9.15, 9.30, 10 o'clock. They will get here when they get here. And then there are other friends who say, I'll see you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. And you're thinking, "Uh, I know you and I might see you. I might not see you at all. When God tells you that I will be there for you, you can trust me, you can trust him. Because he is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. Here, David says to the Lord, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Do you feel the confidence in David's voice? David is positively looking to the Lord right now, and he is with confidence saying, God, because of the confidence that you have placed into my heart, I will declare your goodness to you, back to you. He, changed, he starts the tune of Psalm chapter number 9 and 1 and 2, and he begins this, Worthy are you, Lord, of our praises. Worthy is the Lamb. And so we find that whenever you enter into moments of suffering and crisis, be like David. Because later on we're going to find out, wait a minute, David, didn't you start off this thing like, oh, I'm going to get this day going and I know Jesus is with me. Do you remember how you started, David? And David does because he testifies at the very beginning And then he lets us into a sneak peek on what happens. And then he closes chapter 10 and says, I started it out with the Lord, and I'm going to end this with the Lord. And I've got to remind myself, my start and my end doesn't only end, start and end with Jesus, but he was there and he was faithful all along. That is the reminder and the theme of chapter 9 and chapter 10. Don't just talk about how big your problems are, it may do you good to talk about how big your God is. You see, that's why David started off with this praise, because he wanted to remind his heart how big his God really was, so that when the times came when his heart and his mind did not see and feel the living God as the bigness of who he was, he can be reminded that he can tell his problem how big his God is. Some of us have the tendency to tell God how big our problems are, but maybe you need to take a moment and tell your problems how big your God is. Amen? 
So, real faith is not when things are beautiful and bright. Real faith is trusting God when things are ugly and dark. Do you see God or do you see your problems? There were three guys. His name, their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I had a Doberman pincher, and his name was Shadrach. He was a big boy, 100 plus pounds. And we had Caleb only, and as he was growing up in our house, we just had a, a smaller house, and mom was getting afraid that, you know, what Dobermans could possibly do to our brand new baby. And so we had to rehome him, and, but I loved that Doberman. He was, uh, he was a thick boy, but good dog. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you can find them in Daniel chapter number 3. And in Daniel chapter 3, there was a king. His name was Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar made a decree to all the land that every time you heard the hornet um, blow or the particular instrument blow, everyone within the kingdom must pause and they must bow down to this statue of me. If I am in the presence, you bow down to me. If I am not there, bare minimum, you bow down to this statue. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Jewish boys, and they were... Uh, they knew the Lord, the God of Israel, and they were determined that they would not bow down to any other God except for the God of Israel. They had a friend. His name was Daniel. Daniel was likened to them as well. These guys were just fervent in their faith, bold, and were not willing uh, to compromise their faith at all. Well, sure enough, the clarinet or the coronet played, and they were all supposed to bow, and these boys didn't bow. It was pretty obvious because everyone else was on their face and on their knees, but these three boys would not bow, they would not bend, and so now they had to burn. And so the king made a decree and said, take these boys in, and the Bible in Daniel chapter 3 acknowledges that he was so fervently angry at them, make the furnace ten times hotter than it really is. Oh, man, these guys are going to get consumed by the fire, and sure enough, there were guards who took the, uh, the, these three boys in, these three men, young men into near the furnace. And it was so hot. Hi, Sharon. Good to see you back there. We've been praying for her. She had surgery recently. Um, sorry about that. Squirrels and, and, and seeing church family I haven't seen in, in a little bit. All right. Sorry about that. So... These three boys went in there, and the Bible says that it was so hot, even the guards, their clothes and their eyebrows, if you've ever been in a fire, your hair and eyebrows, it starts feeling the intensity of that heat. They felt it. These boys went in, and they were waiting for the moment when they would burn up, and sure enough, you thought it was going to be a quick singe. Nebuchadnezzar declared to the kingdom, wait a minute, I thought I put three guys in there. Who's the other guy that we put in? Wait, is that a guard? What in the world is going on? And it was another man in the fire, and his name was Jesus. And Jesus was with these three boys in the fire, and even though it was burning hot, they were not getting burned. Why? Because Jesus was with them in the fire to declare, hey, I got you, boys. You may go through hardships. You may stand for me, but this moment, I am going to stand for you. You're not going to get burned. So you can go ahead and stand here in the fire, and you can be confident in the crisis. And that, my friend, is a metaphor of the boldness that you and I can have when we walk through the fires of our life. When Jesus is with us, when Jesus is for you, who can be against you? These boys knew it. They walked around and they're like singing, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I'm going to rejoice because ain't no fire going to touch me now. I don't think that's how the song goes, but just make it up. Make it up as you go because you don't know how to sing. You see, when you have confidence, you can put me in the fire. I may get burned. But here's what I want you to catch from the story of Daniel 3. 
It wasn't that these Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed, Abednego said to themselves, oh yeah, they can't touch us, no fire is going to touch us. As a matter of fact, it was quite the opposite. Here's what they said amongst themselves and to King Nebuchadnezzar. King, you can put us in the fire. God is going to save us, but if not, that's all right. They had a whatever God intends, we're going to go ahead and trust God because we trust in Almighty God and we trust in His sovereignty no matter what. There are going to be things in your life where you can walk in with boldness and say, God's got this. And then there's going to be other times in your life you're going to have to say to yourself, God's got this, I think. But if not, how's my faith? Do I really believe that God, I love God and he loves me? Can I trust him even when I don't see him? Even when I don't feel him? Even though I know and I've sung Waymaker, but I'm like, ooh, I'm not sure if God knows the way or not. Can you still trust him? James, the apostle, Paul, uh, apostle, declared this in James chapter 1 in verse 2 through 4. Count it all joy. My brothers, when you meet trials and fires of various kinds. Fires was it in there, but I put that in there for the context of our reading in Daniel, all right? Trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Pastor, I liked it before when you told us that everything was going to be all right. <laughs> I liked it before when you told us that all things work together for God. But this verse is like, oh, it looks like I'm going to go through it. And God's trying to perfect me and show me what my character is made of. Did you know that pure gold is best when it is refined, when all the impurities are out of it, when all of the dross is out of it? You might be going through the fire, but not because God doesn't love you, but because he is trying to sanctify you and purify you and remove things out of your life life so that he can turn you into a trophy of his grace but you're resisting it you're like front door show me I'm not staying in this oven no way I'm walking out and God is trying to perfect you and remove the dross and the impurities because he wants you to be pure gold when I am tried are you going to be like burning up or are you going to be purified and are you going to glorify in the midst of your purified you see show me the christian who walks the talk not talks the talks because your talk talks and your walk talks but your walk talks louder than your talk talks did you get that your talk talks your walk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. So can you walk out your faith? Ye who believe in God, you who are supposedly a Christ follower, show me your walk. Paul, the apostle, said in Romans 5, chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, he said this, not only that, we, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. Do you have the Holy Spirit of God? Do you have God in you? James, Paul, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, these men understood that in the light of what Christ did for us by providing salvation, the difficulties we experience in this life take us to new meaning. They are 
a means through which God works to accomplish his will in our lives to shape us so that we can reflect the character of Christ. On the basis of this purpose, all adversity, all adversity works together for good, for our good, and for God's glory. I want to give you, as best as I can with the time that I have, I want to give you a couple of points how you can be confident in crisis. Number one, crisis gets our attention. When adversity comes, we are forced to face problems and pressures that are too big for us to resolve. Raise your hand if you are married. Would you put it up? Help me here. All right. I want to do my best to help everybody that's married in this room. Don't just talk about how you love each other when things are beautiful, when intimacy is good, when he loves you, she loves you. Show me your love when things aren't going that great. We, Susan and I, this past July, last month, married 21 years. 21 years, basically, we finally went into adulthood in our, <laughs> in our marriage. I wish I could tell you that everything was pretty and amazing. 21 years of love. This year, I wrote her a love song. And it's published on iTunes and on Spotify. And it's called The Best is Yet to Come. I do not sing, but I wrote it. Tell me or show me. I can tell Susan I love her all day long, but if I'm not showing her that I love her, my talk talks. My walk talks, but my walk talks louder than my talk talks. You see, sometimes crisis gets our attention because that's the moment where your walk has to equal your talk. 21 years compared to the people in this room is small change, just a drop in the bucket. And I wish to get to 25 and eventually get to 50. And we have many beautiful marriages. Beautiful not because it's perfect, but beautiful because you went through it. You just got to go through it. That's what makes it beautiful. That's why I love our church, because we have a multi-generational church family. So that a pastor can stand at 21 years of marriage and a new young couple who's starting off their marriage and five years, ten years, they can sort of like relate a little bit. And then someone who is 21 or 30 or 50 years in their marriage, we've got those too in our church family. We also have those who have lost a loved one. This week, Dorothy, today's Dorothy's birthday. Dale, it's not fun, is it? Next week is their anniversary. It's not fun, is it? We have those too. Sitting in our room in the very moment, if you're watching online, you might not see everyone in the room, but there are, there are widows and widowers within our church who have lost a loved one. And somehow, their love is still there for their spouse, and they are making it through every day. Those are the ones, young couples, that you can look to and say, so glad we have a multi-generational church. That's not all about young people or middle-aged people. It's just people. People from all walks of life, all stages of life, all experiences of life, and I can learn from them. All four of you ladies right here, five of you, including Tim. Tim lost his loved one this year. Yet they sit in this front row. I was sitting in the middle, leaning over, looking at them. I saw your mouths moving. I saw you singing. I watched you sing. They sing because of a God who is faithful, not because life is pretty. 
can you sing to a God who is faithful as opposed to singing because everything's okay? That's what David reminded us in Saul, in 2 Corinthians 12, chapter 12, verse 7 through 10. It says this, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Apologies, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll come back to that verse. Matthew 11 is what I meant to read. Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Adversity is a classroom in which we can learn more about Christ and learn to be more like him. That's what adversity does. Adversity is a classroom where we can learn to be more like Christ. Does crisis have your attention? Maybe it should. Maybe it should. Number two, crisis reminds us of our weaknesses. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 says this, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, the word therefore is an exclamation to say because of. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You may not have the power of Christ because you haven't asked for his power during your weakness. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with my weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Fine. I'll be weak so that he can be strong and so that I can be strong in him. Greater is he that is in me anyways than he that is in the world. Not greater am I than the world. No, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Num uh, as we accept our unchangeable features and embrace God's purposes for our difficult difficulties, we will experience the power of Christ in our lives. We can trust God to care for us and provide for us like a father provides for his children. As a matter of fact, Psalm 103 says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. Number three, crisis motivates us to cry out to God. Crisis motivates us to cry out to God. Psalm 3, we are to cry out to God with a loud voice. Psalm 9, he forgets not the cries of the humble in Psalm 9, 12. Number 4, crisis strengthens our hatred for sin. Crisis strengthens our hatred for sin. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says, Now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that uh, perishes, though it is tried by fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Crisis in God's is God's method of purifying our faith. Number five. Number six. Crisis is a reminder to pray for our authorities. I want to pause for a moment and give attention to this truth. Crisis is a reminder to pray for our authorities. Those who are in positions of responsibility are supposed to provide protection for those under their care. Parents, you know this. Employers, you know this. 
Civic leaders, you know this. Leaders, you know this. World leaders, politicians, you know this. When there are failures in the life of a leader, not only is that cognizant of his character and abilities, but the question then gives to us is this. What do we do about that? When we recognize that a leader is but feet of clay. Do you grumble and bemoan and lament? Do you yell and scream or post online? Is your coffee time bemoaning your leader? As we experience the pressures of temptations, we should realize that those who are in authority over us are also going and undergoing temptations and even incapacities beyond their ability to be effective in their own leadership. Well then, what is our responsibility? The Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 1 and 2, he says this, First of all, then I urge that all supplications, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Everyone say all people. For kings and for all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. In the words of Jesus Christ, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what is God. Obey them that have the rule over you, for we are all subject to one another. But what happens when my leaders don't align with my philosophies? May I encourage you and urge you to pray for them. May I encourage you and urge you to vote to make a difference in the upcoming elections. May I encourage you May I urge you and edify you that this was not exclusive to kings and presidents, congressmen and senators. It says for all people who have rule over you. Are, is there a wife that you need to be subject to? Be subject one to another. The Bible does say that. Is there a husband that you need to be subject to? Is there a teacher that you need to be subject to? Is there a principal that you need to be subject to? Is there an employer or a supervisor or a manager that you need to be subject to? Not necessarily to them, but to the lordship of Christ and his sovereignty in the relationship with them, for them, to them in your life. You need to pray for them. Number seven, I'm wrapping up. Crisis tests our friendship. Crisis tests our friendship friendships. The strain and adversity impacts relationships. Hard times reveal if people want to get or to give. Weather, fair weather friends won't endure the test of trials and difficulties. But, 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 true friends will remain to offer support, comfort, and encouragement in the midst of challenges. Proverbs 17, 17 says this, a friend loves at, everyone say, all times. All people all times. And a brother is born for adversity. Hard times. Number eight, crisis invites us to experience the power of God. Troubles reveal that are on our own. We can't live in a way that honors God. So then all of a sudden, we recognize in Philippians 3, 8, and 10, it says this, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. Uh, in other words, modern day language, poo-poo. I count them all as poo. Compared to the excellency that I may win Christ and be found in Him, 
not having my own righteousness, but which is the law, but that through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Oh, man, Paul knew that Jesus knew what suffering was like. Lastly, crisis prepares us to comfort others. 1 Corinthians 1 says, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation. He didn't just take my tribulation away. No. He came in the middle of our tribulation and he comforts us in our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort others which are in trouble by the comfort with which we ourselves received comfort. The reason that you went through such hardship was maybe so that you can lean over to the person on your left and say, I know because I was there too. I was there when I had to spend a month in the hospital. I know because I was there when I was depressed. I know when I was there when I had a friend stab me in the back. I know what it was like because I lost a spouse. I know what it was like because I lost a job. I know what it's like when you're lonely. I know what it's like and fill in your moment of crisis. But you can't say that to someone who recognizes that you don't know what you're talking about because you've never been there. But because you've been there, now all of a sudden your, your street credit, all right, your street credit just went way up because I know you went through hardship yourself. So when you put your arm around me and you say, you're going to make it. It's going to be all right. God's got you. Maybe it'll mean so much more because you went through it. Because crisis prepared you to comfort someone else. Let's pray. Let's all stand to our feet. I don't know where you are in your crisis, but I pray that the message will give you some confidence to go into your crisis. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. If you are here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can't be confident because you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that once appointed unto man, after this, the judgment. Meaning there is going to be a time where you will one day die. I have no idea when that day is for you. I don't even have an idea of when that day is for me. But one day you will die and you will meet your maker. And you have to stand before God and you have to know for sure why heaven could be your eternal home. And the only way, my friend, that you can know that is if you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says that he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Today, receive the gift of God so you can have eternal life. If you are here today and you say, Pastor, I am not a Christian. I do not know for sure that heaven is my eternal home, but today I would like to have that confidence. Would you pray for me, Pastor? If you'll raise your hand, I promise to pray for you. And I promise that maybe this week, today even, that we can chat and we can, we can know, I can show you from the Word of God how you can have the confidence of your eternal security, of your eternal home. If you're like that today, raise your hand and put it down. Anybody like that today? God bless you, young lady. You've been coming to church so faithfully. I'm proud of you. Anybody else? One young lady who's celebrating, who celebrated her birthday just last week. She's going to celebrate another second birthday. It's called her spiritual birthday today. Anybody else? Put your hand up and put it down. Brave enough like this young girl? As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, young lady, you can pray a prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner, but please forgive me of all my sins and take me to heaven when I die. The best that I know how I believe in you. 
and I trust you to be my Savior. Help me to live out my faith. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe in you. Maybe you're in this room and you're going through a crisis. Or you need to take these notes and you say, I'm going to tuck this one in my back pocket because one day I will go through a crisis. And you can take your notes out and you can see how you can handle your crisis. And you can be more confident than you were yesterday. You can say, Pastor, this message ministered to me. I'm going to use something today. Something from the Word of God helped me today. Would you raise your hand as a testimony to that? God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Father, bless our church family. Lord, when hardships come into our life, would you give us confidence in Christ Jesus to go through the storm? Would you be our Lord? Would you be our Savior? Would you be our God? And help us to be reminded of that. Even in crisis, you are still a trustworthy God. Bless those, especially that have raised their hand as a testimony to the desire that they have to walk out their faith.